Welcome back, podcast patrons, to another episode of Leave the Pin In. Tonight's episode sees me without Moan Scotto once again, but in his place, I've got a great interview lined up for you today. We have Dougie from the golf clan of Instagram and YouTube fame. Dougie, what's the good word? How are you, Dan? Real, I'm good, my man. I'm, I'm super excited to talk to you, and I think one of the biggest things that I'm excited about, and we talked a little off-air about this, is how social media has brought people together. And this is a perfect example, you and I. We would have never have met beforehand. Um, you know, you live down south, I live in the northeast, but we connected through Instagram, and then through that, you know, um, I've gotten into your YouTube channel and following your Instagram posts, and it's just grown from there. I think it's amazing. I do too. I think the first time that I came across Leave the Pin was a post where you won this contest from Cutter and Buck. Yes. <laughs> Can you talk about that video in case any of your listeners haven't oh, seen it? Dude, so um, for the new people that you know have kind of joined us in the last two months or so, I, I entered this Cutter and Buck bucket list contest, and they were asking for bucket list trip ideas, and my son and I were doing an entire Midwest road trip that revolved around our beloved St. Louis Cardinals, um, it revolved around Top of the Rock and, and Mountaintop and Big Cedar Lodge, um, a, a bunch of other courses, uh, this old Ross course that we uh, discovered in Asheville, North Carolina, which is where my uncle lived, and we visited him. And so basically, we hit up 11 states in, oh gosh, I guess just about two and a half weeks, and just my, my 12-year-old son and I, and we did it kind of before he turned you know, to be a teenager. Um, and him and I sat and planned the trip and they loved it. And they outfitted us with the most ungodly amount of clothes. Dougie, I will tell you this, and this is no word of a lie. There are still jackets, vests, and quarter zip pullovers in my closet that I have yet to wear. And this is, this is two and a half months after the trip, three months after the trip. That's incredible. I just remember your video showing shirt after shirt after jacket after jacket and I was like this is incredible. So I got a a uh, a few DMs and people said is that, was that on replay? Like did you just keep I said no, like I'm literally flipping through all those shirts. Every shirt was a unique shirt. Like every jacket was unique. I didn't just double them up and like play it, you know, two times fast at all. <laughs> that was crazy. So you got to go on the trip and they also outfitted you. Yes. Yeah, and uh, you know, a lot of the stuff was like cold weather gear. So w- over the next month or so, I envision wearing a ton of it out on the course. Um, you know, once up here in the Northeast, once November hits, it's uh, it's kind of for the diehards only out there. Right. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. So that was the first video that introduced me to leave the pin in, and then I got plugged in with the podcast. I've been following you, traveling a little bit to some different you know, professional events. And it's just really cool to see some behind the scenes access. Yeah. I, I love giving that. Um, the story I always tell is this Scott and I at the 2002 U S open at Beth page, we're sitting at the range. Now Beth, Beth page is the course that we grew up on. So we're very familiar with it. Like I grew up sleigh riding there when I was a kid and we're on the range and we're sitting in the first row and we're looking down at the driving range and there are the players And it's all these other people milling around behind them. And I looked at Scott and I said, how in the world do those people get to be down there? Like, there's no, (laughs) there's no reason. There's no good God given reason that you and I shouldn't be down there. And Scott just looked at me and he says, well, what reason do we have for being down there? (laughs) And I, and, and okay, granted that was 17 years ago. It took us a little while, but we now have a reason. (laughs) Wow. So I always say, like, when we are down there, I said, like, look at those people. They're wondering how in the world are we <laughs> down there. But I will I'm 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 happy to tell you and I'm happy to say that when we were at the Wyndham Championship, they have all the coolers for the players and the caddies and stuff, and there were guys along the ropes looking like, Oh my god, I'm 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 right up against the ropes, but I can't step foot on the range and I just gave those waters and gatorades out to everyone. I did not care. <laughs> That is awesome. Thankfully, wow. no one no one caught me doing it. 
that's so cool to move from spectator to being on the front line. It, it's it's crazy. Uh, it's not something that we take lightly. You know, I I love um, having that privilege, and and I we always try our best to kind of give people an inside look at the tour and whatever else we're involved in. Uh, one of the things that I like most, I mean, there's a ton of things I like about your page, the golf clan the most, but what I'd really love to talk about is your YouTube channel because sure. you do a great job of balancing uh, humor. You do a, ba- a great job of balancing swing tips um, and even some inside stuff. We we're talking off air about your PJ Tour Superstore review video. Right? Oh, yeah. You, you would think, like, okay, videoing myself at the PJ Tour Superstore is boring as hell. But you have found <laughs> a way to make it interesting <laughs> to people and to kind of give them that experience of what it's like to walk into these, this megalith of, of, a, you know, of a store, this consumerism golf extravaganza building where you could literally, A, get lost, uh, and B, <laughs> max out your credit card on the same day. So give me some idea into your mindset as to why you want to do that video and kind of what went into setup of that because it's a long, like that's a 10 minute video and I know it was not just 10 minutes of videoing. Right. No, so that's a, that was a very fun video to make. I've been in Atlanta, Georgia for just over two years now and started the golf plan earlier this year. And since getting more serious into golf and especially documenting the golf process through a lot of videos, I finally got around to visiting a PGA Tour Superstore. So that was part of it is I wanted to show my first initial reaction going into this place for the first time, because as I said in the video, I grew up in the Midwest in Indianapolis, Indiana, going to tiny little golf galaxies. And even those tiny little golf galaxies just blew my mind, just being in that full golf store experience. So that's kind of the setup behind the videos. I I wanted to walk through and really just be in awe. And I I absolutely was. It was even bigger than I could have expected. Um, And it was kind of fun being in there too, just figuring out how do I document this without being too over the top walking around with the camera. So it was just a little bit of kind of being subtle here and there, you know, wanting to kind of show the process for shopping and figuring out, you know, do I need this, this training aid? Do I need this extra pair of pants and kind of just walking through that process. And so I set that challenge of, can I spend less than $100 and absolutely failed that. I think I walked out with about $250 worth of a lot of stuff. (laughs) So listen, when you're in there with the camera, I mean, the first thing, if I was in a store and I saw someone with a camera, you know, my mind automatically clicks to this person's creating content. Like I would like to talk to that person. Um, did you have anyone uh, uh, approach you? I mean, like, were there any store people that are like, dude, what, what are you doing now? So that's a great question. And my goal was not to be noticed, obviously, in case they had any sort of, you know, um, rules or regulations for filming in the stores. So I record all of my videos on the iPhone. And so I kind of use that to my advantage and pulling up my phone in a manner where I could be texting, I could be walking, or I could be making a YouTube video, which I was. So those videos are just recorded on your iPhone? Yes, all on the iPhone. I do have extra equipment that I use when I'm out of the golf course in terms of tripods to get different angles and heights. But in the PGA Tour Superstore, I didn't want to bring any of that in. Yeah. So, you know, I was just doing handheld type of work there and trying not to be recording the whole time. So record a little segment, walk around, record a segment, walk around. And fortunately, it's such a big store. There's so much going on that, you know, the golf plane got lost there in the mix. Yeah, for sure. So on average, how, how much of – what percentage do you think of the video that you film gets made into the YouTube video? Do you know what I'm saying? Like for yeah. a 10-minute ten, ten video, like are you recording an hour's worth of stuff or – is it not so much? Right. So for the PJ Tour Superstore review video, it was a higher percentage of realization because as, I was, as we were talking about, I didn't, didn't want to record too much content. But for a typical golf video on my page, I think it's under 25% because I'm getting a lot of shots, a lot of angles. But part of the editing process is making it smooth for the viewers and not showing a lot of dead time. So there's a 20-second gap 
when I'm setting up, dropping clubs and all that. I'm cutting all that out. I'm trying to get right to the action. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so for the people not familiar, obviously the Golf Clan on YouTube and the Golf Clan on Instagram. Give us uh, an idea because I love these stories. How did this come to fruition? Like what was the catalyst? What was the spark to creating and, and implementing and, and, you know, at this point in time, branding the Golf Clan as a social media construct? Yes. So a little bit of background context. I know that you and I might get lost in a, in a different conversation here, but last year I started a YouTube channel to document my fitness journey. So I still have it out there. It's, it's Dougie Barner, just my name. And that was just a process for me to learn about content creation, learn about YouTube. And as I was training for a men's physique competition, I wanted to share and document that process. So that was sort of the backstory in terms of my familiarity with social media. Okay, so yes, we can definitely go off tangent on this because, I mean, that is something that's near and dear to my heart. Fitness, uh, you know, I teach advanced strength and conditioning. That's something that I've done my entire life. Um, I mean, did you, did you, so let's take it even further back. Did you play sports in high school? How did, how did, how did this kind of fitness regime pop up into your head? Because that's something that interests me. So grew up playing tennis, among other sports, and at a certain point committed 100% to tennis. And then tennis took me all the way through college. So I played in high school growing up in, in Indianapolis and then got a scholarship to play at the University of Notre Dame. So an Irishman. That's right. Yep. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So at Notre Dame, um, did you take an enormous interest in the weight room there, in the fitness facilities? Yeah. So I think I started – getting into lifting weights seriously my senior year of high school and then moving to Notre Dame, the access to the facilities was incredible. I mean, we were lifting weights in the same weight room that the Notre Dame football program lifts weights in. And it's just this gargantuan building with, I mean, I don't even remember how many dozens of squat racks and nice mats you have to do all kinds of Olympic lifting. Um, So having all that available just kind of allowed me to get more into lifting weights. And so, are you golfing at this time still, or you know, when did when did when did golf kind of first rear its head as something super important in your life? So growing up, it was how my dad and I spent our time. You know, like he would love to just go to the range. He would be setting up ladders in our backyard, hitting into a net, just all of that stuff. And so that was sort of our shared interest growing up a little bit. And then obviously it shifted to tennis as I started getting more serious into tennis. But it's been a lifelong passion of mine. I just haven't had the time to dedicate towards going full in on golf because tennis has always been my top priority. So upon graduating from Notre Dame and then finishing law school, now I felt like, okay, I have some free time here. I'm no longer playing competitive tennis. And so first I I went all in into the bodybuilding world. And then after a year or so, I shifted gears and started up the golf clan. Very cool. So one of the things that I always find is I I personally walk this razor thin line in my fitness um, between being too bulky and immobile, um, but I like to lift heavy, and balancing that with the fluidity and flexibility needed with the golf swing. Um, You know, so... I find myself in kind of like these mesocycles of, okay, I can go heavy in the winter because I'm not playing as much golf. But in the summertime, you know, my lifting consists of more cardio-based activities, uh, obviously a ton of more muscular endurance-based activities. But then I fall into this trap where I'm like, ah, I really don't like the way the physique looks right now. I need to start lifting heavy again, but I can't lift heavy because I need to play golf. And it drives me insane because I want the best of both worlds, but right. I can't lift the way I want to lift and still play the golf that I want to play the way I know I can play it. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. And I would be interested to hear kind of what your perspective is on how persons that like to lift weights should kind of structure just generally kind of their time in the gym while they're also spending a lot of time playing golf. So I think the biggest thing is what you want to be better at. 
Um, if you actually want to be a better golfer, then yeah, I mean, you, you probably want to stay away from the compound movements and going heavy with them. Some of the compound okay. movements are great. I mean, obviously, some of the Olympic lifts are phenomenal, but when you start going super heavy and and you tend to bulk and you cut the cardio out, um, you know, finding that range of motion of the golf swing is super, super difficult. Um, right. So, I, and I, I hate name dropping, but long story short, I've done some personal training with some ladies on the LPGA tour. Some of them will be wow. coming on the pod for the 50th episode. Love it. She knows who she is and she knows she's out there, but... Um, with that being said, one of the, you know, the, the, the again, it, it, especially for the pros, the razor thin line is, and with some of the females out there that wanted to, you know, maybe lose a little bit of weight and tone up, they don't realize how much the change in body composition affects the golf swing. And that is multiplied tenfold when you're talking about the professional level. Um, it's, it's, it's the thing where Tim Lumpy Heron drops 40 pounds and loses his game. John Daly wow. cuts out, you know, he, he cuts out regular soda, goes down to diet soda and drops some weight and his game goes to crap because mm. his body and those muscular tendencies and those motor neuron pathways are forged with a body type that is like exhibit A, but now his body type is exhibit B. So you're kind of trying to relearn that swing with a new body type. And I'll give you even a closer to heart example. Um, Tyler, the creator who does all of our visuals, you know, I give him the ideas and he turns those into kind of graphic design um, visuals. He has lost, he's going to kill me because I know should know the exact number, but something like 180 pounds in the last wow. two years or so. And That's phenomenal. Yeah, and went from having like no backswing because he couldn't rotate to having something similar to an actual golf swing now and literally had to relearn how to play golf all over again. That is so interesting. So, you know, you, again, it's, it's this real razor thin line of, do you want to be cut, ripped and taut with tight muscles or do you want to have maybe a little pliability in them and be able to reach full extension with the golf swing? You know, so it, it is it is the biggest chat. You know, and God, first world problems, right? That's the biggest challenge of my life is is <laughs> <laughs> is, is bouncing between those two worlds. Um, you know, uh, I, I guess I don't know. I wish I could tell you which one is more important to me because I would say golf, but then I'm like, nope, I want to live forever. So fitness is, and I want to say fitness, but golf is an enormous part of my life. So it's tough. It's right. tough to find that balance. Question. I got a question for you. So yeah. when I started the golf plan a few months ago, I messaged a former Notre Dame golfer and friend of mine, and I said, I'm here in the gym. You know, what should I be trying to work on today? And he responded, joking, of course, by saying, just two chest buys and tries because that's what Captain does. <laughs> yeah, hit all the show muscles. So how does that kind of fit into what you're saying? I mean, does he really just lift heavy and he's able to keep his game? Some people are freaks, right? And some people are just built like freaks. We were watching the Jets game last night because unfortunately we're just long suffering Jets fans. And uh OBJ caught this amazing pass down the sideline. I turned to my son and I said, That's that's a freak. Okay? Like you can't teach that. That's just a genetic freak. And there are people like that. Um right. you know, it, it, in the golf world, like Tony Finau sticks out to me as a genetic freak. He has half of a backswing and yeah. averages 325 off the tee. Crazy. You can't teach that. You know, it's something that he honed over the years and his body type allowed him to do that. Um, you know what? If, if, if you have a short rotation in your golf swing and all you do is, you know, <laughs> chest buys and tries and you have this uh, uh, an enormous imbalance between your rear delts and, and your pecs, um, yeah, if you don't rotate much, I guess you could get away with it. If you don't, yeah. if you don't use any lower body or any ground force, I guess you can get away with it. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Just distinguishing kind of his golf swing is a little bit different in terms of the swing plane and how he turns in the backswing 
and he might just have some genetic advantages that most of us don't. Yeah, I mean, you said he played at Notre Dame. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you're you're talking about a a, a top point five percent golfer in the world, honestly. You right. know, right? Um, because I think what I think if you can break a hundred, if you can honestly break a hundred, like you're one of the, in the top. 10% of all golfers or something crazy like that. Wow. So imagine someone playing D1 golf at Notre Dame, you yeah. know? Yeah, that's a different stratosphere. So you you mentioned it's 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 really only been 2 months with the golf clan. So no, I started the Instagram page about 4 months ago and then quickly kind of rolled into the YouTube as well. Um so yeah, it, it has been just a matter of months and Going back to what you kind of started off this episode by by saying is just it's just incredible the connections that you can make through social media today. Whereas before the era of social media, you'd be so limited in, in the golfers that you would be able to connect with across the world. I feel like I feel like golf is the one sport where its stars, quote unquote, if you will, seem a lot more approachable. Um, and a lot more accessible on social media. I, I don't, you know, like I don't see LeBron James tweeting out things or, or responding to people on Instagram. I don't see, you know, even like um, I don't know uh, Bryce Harper or someone like that or Mike Trout or, or um, you know regional guys in your area that might be a second tier first baseman or something reaching out to people on Instagram and stuff. But golfers do and and. One of the funniest things I saw, now, most people give me flack for this, but I'm an enormous Bryson fan, and, you know, <laughs> right, the patron saying of leave the pin in. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I love his, I love his quirkiness. I, or Scott and I are in love with the fact that he hates the USGA. Um, oh, yeah. It's just, it, it's, it's, look, it's, it's humorous, and it's entertainment, right? So... Um, one of the things PGA memes put a thing up, like tag your favorite golfer, see if they'll respond. I thought, good Lord, that is just brilliant. All these people put Bryson down and here's Bryson, like imagine him sitting at home or in his car in his Bentley or something. And he's messaging these people back. Like what other sport do you get their top level stars doing that? I can't think of one. That's wild. Props to him for taking the time to do that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he gets a bad rap, but I mean, you know, it is what it is. And I must say, I invite him every week, every Monday. This is a little, another little behind the scenes thing, Dougie. Every Monday, I send him a message on Instagram and I say, <laughs> here is your weekly podcast invite. Get back to me. I think it's great. I think it's just a matter of time. I mean, he jumped on the four play pod to talk about the slow play issue. So I think he's open to jumping into different podcasts in the media. Just keep keep reaching out to them. I'm going to just keep on plugging away. That's all. So let me let me ask you this. What has, because I know we've had a few of those incidents, what, what's been kind of like an aha moment in social media for you that would have never happened without the Instagram account, without the YouTube channel? Maybe it's meeting someone or, or getting access to a course or something like that, that even six months ago you would have never imagined happening? Yeah. So upon starting the golf clan, I was trying to, to connect with other golfers and a couple of accounts jumped out to me as being located in the Atlanta vicinity. And so reached out, direct messaged those accounts. And I mean, now they're guys that I golf with on a weekly, biweekly basis. And just the fact that I never probably would have connected with them in person without having an Instagram, having the golf plan account. To me, that was just so cool. And they're also kind of pursuing different golf content creation paths. And so to have that kind of supportive community, I think is wild. So where, where's your home course then? Or do you have one? I mean, or where, where do you normally play out of? So Bobby Jones golf course, I would say would be designated my home course. It's the closest course to where I live and I don't belong to any private clubs. So it's kind of the place that I frequent most. And is that, um, like, give us an idea of the layout of that course. Is it, is it hilly, you know, parkland style? Yeah. So 
Bobby Jones is a nine hole course, but it's reversible. So they recently renovated it, switched it from an 18 hole course. And then now it is a, they, they built in a range now. And so the greens have two pins on them. You can play two different and completely different layouts. That's pretty sick. So it could play differently every day. So yeah, so there's a Magnolia and Azalea routing and they're completely different tee boxes on number one, going to different greens and every hole throughout there is different. So on one of the nines, you're playing to a green as a par three and on the next, you're playing the opposite direction coming in as a par four. That's, you know, that things like that. Um, I know, I think, gosh, I, I think it's Doak that has the loop. Um course or, or somebody has the one where it's completely reversible you can play it from one to 18 but then you can also play it 18 back to one the the thought and ability to shape the land to do that blows my mind absolutely yeah it's it's a cool concept and i was not familiar with courses like this um you know last year before i ran into courses like sweden's cove but it seems like golf is kind of moving and kind of uh, following the modern society in that, you know, it's, it's tough to get land. It's tough to be close to city centers. So how do we serve these populations? We have to kind of be more um, efficient with the space we have. Yeah, without a doubt. And it, it's funny because the Sweetens Cove post, I specifically remember is one of the first ones that I remember seeing on your Instagram page. Um, for people that don't know, it's in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee. Am I right? Yeah. Right. Exactly you know, I mean, right. <laughs> literally, it's 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 an if you build it, they will come type course like um, Sand Hills would be uh, Mammoth Dunes, you know, Cabot Links, any of those courses, Abandon, you know, any of those courses just in the middle of nowhere. How did how did that come about? You heading down to play there because Sweetens is. While probably not nationally known by the bigger golf community, it is definitely, would you agree in calling it like an Instagram cult-like following of a course? Absolutely. No, absolutely. I'm glad you brought it up because that was sort of another aha moment is, you know, a couple months into having the Golf Plans account, I saw someone, I think Sweeten shared in the story because... Sweden is very active on social media, and, and I think that helps with the following is that people always know what's going on. They're sharing daily posts, um, daily story updates, and one of their stories was, we have this golf outing, and we're looking for two more people. And so I followed the person who posted that. I said, hey, you know, I'm a couple hours away in Atlanta. These dates work for me. Is this, is this opening um, still available? I'd love to join your, your invitational. And he said, absolutely, you know, you're you're all booked you're you're in and so a buddy of mine and i drove to sweetens uh for the first time and leading up to that trip you know i was watching all the youtube videos watching the ringer just trying to to read a bunch of articles on the course because like you said there's this hype to sweetens that is unlike anything else that i've seen and so it was cool to kind of just binge on all that sweetens content and then go there and spend a day you know meeting 30 strangers that i didn't know before playing in this golf outing. I was recording it all. I'm, I'm, I should be releasing the course vlog from, from that trip next week, but it ended up being an incredible experience. Okay, so Sweeten's beat a nine-hole course, uh, no range. They are putting in a practice putting green now, correct? Yes. Okay, so nine-hole course, middle of nowhere, Tennessee. Um, gosh, why can't I think of the architect's name right now? Uh, Rob Collins. Rob Collins, thank you. Yeah, Collins, uh, and he's got his own business, and it's called something I can't remember. And, and yeah, King Collins Golf. King, thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay. I didn't know if it was Collins and King or whatnot. King Collins, right? So Rob Collins as this, um, let's, let, uh, gosh, I guess call him New Age, uh, Nouveau Golf Minimalist Design, Middle of Nowhere, Tennessee. You've played it. Does it live up to the hype? It's so funny you asked that. I was thinking about trying to share about my experience. And I think on the one hand, it absolutely does. Yet on the other hand, having been there once and kind of taken it all in, uh, there are some other places that I might want to go back to play again, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I, I understand that completely. Now, 
I know there's a bunch of, you know, I talk about on Instagram, a bunch of the hidden holes where you can play a little bit of that yeah. cr- cross-country golf and whatnot. I'm assuming it's completely different than your typical nine-hole course. There seems to be a lot more um, variety, a lot more openness. So I feel like, now, did you play once around the nine? Did you play it twice? How, how did that day work? So we had match play set up. So we played... 27 holes and then on top of that the entire group walked and played some illuminati course routing holes gotcha gotcha which are in those for the illuminati holes for the people not familiar with them on instagram those are kind of a certain tee box to a certain green and it's you know it's it becomes a completely different hole a completely different shot completely different shot shape a completely different look there yeah exactly and to go to your question about kind of the layout and the landscape of it, it's just unlike any other course that I've played in that it's, it's not very long and in many ways, you know, the holes can be short and, you know, there's ample fairway width and things like that. But some of the design choices, especially when you get around the greens, just makes for an experience that, that teaches you how to how to think through shots and you're not just hitting to the middle of the green you're not just hitting towards the flag because of the undulation there and the greens are huge and there's double greens so there's a lot of different variations with the pin there's just it seems like limitless possibilities in terms of different approach shots you can have different putts you can have with different speeds and i know a lot of times courses that have unconventional routing are often kind of written off as being tricked up holes that people don't like. But something about Sweetens is it, it somehow keeps its charm even while being more on that end of toward the tricked up side. So I've watched a bunch of videos on it. Um, honestly, didn't know that was coming out from you, so definitely looking forward to that course vlog. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, are the greens tricked up to the point of it being semi-Mickey Mouse or – do they have more of a, let's say, Pinehurst number two esque quality around the greens? So definitely more towards the the Pinehurst feeling. Okay, gotcha. And so a little it, bit more yeah, natural. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I think that's where Rob Collins has gotten so much praise is that it, it retains this character that is for many American golfers that haven't traveled, you know, like myself, you go and play this course and you feel like you're in a different world in terms of the course design and in terms of how the greens are, you know, with different hills and different, you know, ridges and things of that nature. Um, the bunkering is another part of what makes that course special, but it doesn't get to that point where it's just, this isn't fair. This isn't fun. What, what's, uh, what's an average rate for nine holes there? Do you even know? Or, So I don't know, but I think what makes part of why Sweetens has such a cult-like following is that they have all-you-can-play rates, and so Mm. you can go there and, you know, for somewhere between $60 and $110, you can play as many holes as you want. And so the the value is just, it's tough to beat there, um, given that they don't, they, they haven't seemed to raise the prices in response to the increasing awareness and demand to play the course. Right, and at that price, I mean, it's almost a steal. You could get there early in the morning, hang out with your buddies. I mean, you could you could loop through that course eight, nine times probably easily. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because it's in the middle of nowhere, you won't have that typical, oh, it's, you know, it's Sunday, so it's going to be a six-hour round type of feel. It pretty much feels like for, for many of the days that you can go at your own pace, you can play as quickly as you'd like to. One of the things that I thought was super cool and and – I know you can probably only do it a small course like that in the middle of nowhere, but they, they do days where you can rent out the whole course for yourself. So if you and I don't remember the price, I think it was like 2,700 or three grand or something, but imagine if you had, you know, like you said, 30 guys that showed up or even 10 guys and you say, Hey, 300 bucks a dude. And the course is ours for the entire day. I mean, that's like, uh, hell I'd be in on that. (laughs) Yeah, Exactly. No one out there behind you. You can do whatever you want. And and I think the open-mindedness of, you know, the owners of the course and the operators of the course, that kind of adds to it, right? You you never get that feel of, oh, is this allowed? Or am I allowed to do this? Or it's just completely no frills golf, yet the the quality of it and the design of it is is so high 
that, yeah, you could rent it out there. You could just go and kind of make up your own holes. You could play the same hole, you know, several times in a row, kind of do whatever you'd like. Yeah, I would love if they would be the forebearers of a of a re- revolution in golf. I love playing nine holes. Uh, you made a great point before about how land is so scarce nowadays. Um, and let's be honest, there's a ton of 18-hole courses that are out there that are just absolute crap that could easily right. be blown up and be made into phenomenal nine-hole courses. Absolutely. And I think another issue, at least here in Atlanta, is that the access to driving ranges it's so difficult, especially when you're living close to the city. So I live kind of smack dab in the, the metro area. And if you don't belong, if you, if you don't belong to a private club and haven't forked over those ridiculously high initiation fees with traffic issues, you know, you're looking at a 30 to 45 minute drive sitting through traffic to go hit balls. And so kind of being more creative in terms of offering different golf experiences apart from that traditional 18 holes. Um, I think it's going to be huge moving forward. It, it's funny. I was thinking in the back of my mind about the traffic there. We have friends that live in Atlanta. Um, we know some tour pros that live up uh, north of where you are in Woodstock. And okay. you know, one of the biggest problems in getting to courses or when deciding a course to join if that is where you are in life is just what you mentioned, the traffic there. You know, there there's a course um, – you know, on the other side of the beltway, but I mean, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get there. So that one's out, you know, so I've got now instead of five courses to choose from, I've only got two that are within realistic drive of me. So having smaller pieces of property, even if it's a part three course or something like that, makes a world of difference if it's accessible, right? The more accessible it is, the more likely you are to play it and to practice there. I think that's a great point. I think mean, that's a great point, and I think there will be a move towards more shorter type of courses. And I know that Top Golf has sort of sprung up there, but I think at least my view is Top Golf is more for the fun. You go with friends, you go to have a drink and eat some food. You're not really going to be bringing your clubs there and hitting full bucket. No, not for the prices they charge. No, definitely not <laughs> you're worth not, the time. You're not, it's not worth eighty dollars to work on your game. You know what I mean for for an hour or so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's worth eighty bucks to get a friend drunk that's never golfed before and put them up on YouTube. That's a good idea. <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> so you are smack dab in Atlanta, and I know you got a chance to be at East Lake for the Tour Championship. But I think what's even more special, and in my opinion, super cool because I love behind the scenes things, and I know our listeners do too. You got to be at East Lake before the tour championship showed up. Um, give us a little idea how that was. How'd that come about? Yeah, so I've had the good fortune of getting invited to play East Lake a few times, and now that I've started my career, you know, my full time career as a corporate attorney it's been nice to have like a corporate membership. And so Eastlake is, is unique in that it doesn't take individual members. It it started back um, with 60 original members and then they've now only opened it up to corporate membership. Huh. I I never knew that. Yeah. So there's 60 individual members and um, a lot of companies have, have access to go out and bring clients and entertain that way. But it isn't the type of place where, a wealthier individual can just say, hey, you know, I have this amount of money. Let me in as a member. Okay, so so let me interrupt quick. And, and so how does a corporate membership work? Uh, is it like a membership at like an NFL game where, you know, this business gets eight tickets and they dole it out each game how how they want? How, how does a, a company go about that? Yeah, I don't think it's too different than what you're talking about, having a suite at some of those stadiums. So the corporate membership just serves the function of, you know, obviously the company is going to pay over X amount of dues. And then its employees have the benefit to go out whenever they'd like to and either pay out of their own pockets to go and play through the corporate membership, um, paying guest fees, or to use kind of different budgets for marketing and business development to go out and bring any potential clients or existing clients out uh, to entertain them by playing it that way. Are you are you allowed to say what a guest fee is at East Lake? Just out of curiosity. 
Yeah, yeah. So I think a guest fee would range between about two and three hundred dollars. I think it depends on caddy fees and you know how many caddies are walking with the group and how much you'd like to tip them. That's a steal for there. Yeah, no, it's an absolutely stunning place, and the fact that I've gotten to to go out and play it a couple of times has been incredible. You know, one of the things about the course is it's such a historic place and so traditional. You know, the type of place where you have to take your hat off before walking through the clubhouse. And then through walking the clubhouse, it's incredible looking at the trophies and the, the shrines of Bobby Jones and seeing so many. It feels like a museum, honestly, walking through the clubhouse. That I've seen, again, I've seen videos of it, um, you know, never experienced it. But, I mean, that sounds beyond amazing. And when you juxtapose that to what some other courses charge in terms of greens fees you know 200 bucks at a place like east lake is i mean who wouldn't pay that if if given the opportunity exactly yeah exactly right it is one of those places where you know one time it is absolutely worth it if you you know know someone who whose company is a member there to go out and experience it very very cool very cool um so give us an idea of kind of what is in the works for the golf clan? What does the future hold? Because, you know, knowing you for a little bit, I kind of think I know how your mind works and it's always maybe on, <laughs> on to the next thing. And I think we, we are very similar, uh, in that mindset. So I know there are ideas that are spinning around right now in your head for the future of the golf clan. Absolutely. And I started the golf clan because in part on my personal page, it was becoming more and more golf and then at some point all golf and so I thought it might be smart to just have a channel where I can post and share as many you know stories as possible without feeling like oh this might be too much golf so having that outlet has been awesome and upon originally launching the golf clan I was inviting different people to submit videos and and to become a member is what I you know how I thought about it of the golf clan which to me just meant to be part of the family. And I got a couple of messages saying, this sounds awesome. Can you lay out what a membership might cost? (laughs) And I was like, I was like, like, yes, my Venmo account number is. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And so they were curious about, you know, what this kind of social media golf community might entail and what membership and what website there was affiliated with it. And I told him, frankly, you know, I just launched this. I'm trying to kind of connect with individuals. At this point, I don't have anything lined up in terms of membership. If that changes, I will definitely reach out to you. But that for me was cool just to see that there's this openness of golfers on social media to connect. And there's an increasing amount of small businesses starting that are designed to kind of serve needs that aren't being met among golfers throughout the world. So at this current um, stage of the golf clan's development. I mean, my mission and goal is to connect with people. Like that's kind of what gets me fired up. I run this series on, on my page where I'm sharing golf stories. And so I've invited a lot of different individuals to talk about how they got into golf, what golf means to them and sort of why they play the game. And for me, that is what fires me up the most is reaching out to different accounts, different people that I've been following to invite them to share golf stories and, you know, to open up my messages and see that someone has taken the time to sit down and record and send over their golf journey. I mean, nothing else gets me fired up like that. Yeah. And you've got five of those right now up on the Instagram page, you know, uh, ranging from, um, I gosh, can't remember. I think the Dylan kid was like 13 or so, or, yeah. yeah. Right. Something along that. I knew he was like almost as old as or older, just a little bit older than my oldest son. Um, you know, and, and it's it's awesome to see these people wanting to connect. And I think I think you stated it perfectly. And it was just such a great synopsis of everything that social media is in a positive light. It is connecting with people that you have so much in common with, but due to geographic locations due to whatever social construct and barriers that might be out there, you would never get to meet that person or you would never, you know, in your wildest dreams, tee it up 
with that person. I think that's that's the beauty of golf social media. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, when I first started the account, I'd been living in Atlanta and I wasn't really in any kind of like golf group chats, so to speak, right? Because I didn't grow up in Atlanta and I was just curious about, you know, who else is out here that is dying to get to the golf course. Um, and at that point I wasn't recording. And so, you know, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't look forward to maybe going and playing by myself and through social media, it's just been awesome to connect with so many people, not only, you know, in your vicinity that you can go out and tee it up with, but to meet people and make connections kind of across the world. And, and as far as the, why do you golf series that I've mentioned, so now we actually have close to 20 um, people that have submitted their story. I just took kind of a small break um, after doing the first round, but it's been wild just to see and hear about different journeys and golfing experiences from different parts of the world. So, you know, moving from Australia to Ireland to out in California, you know, to Switzerland, it's, it's so cool to feel like the world can become small through golf. All right, so let me do my just duties as an interviewer. Let me do my job, and let me turn the tables on you and ask you, Dougie, for your final question here, why do you golf? So I have fallen in love with the feeling of hitting the golf ball. So I think it first kind of stems from that, right? As much as I love hanging out with people, it's different if you're hanging around, throwing the the cornhole bags all day, spending time with people, Um it's the love for the game that first and foremost kind of brings me out to the course. But through kind of my years growing up and, you know, seeing my golf game grow and develop, it's the relationships through golf that keep me playing the game. So that's that feeling of that sweet contact, it brings me to the golf course. And then it's the new relationships that develop there that keep me playing. Very cool. Very cool. Um, all right, listen, Plug away. Tell people how to get in touch with you, where they can find you. Um, give them, give them where you're going to be creating all your content. Absolutely. So at YouTube, it's the Golf Clan, and on Instagram, I'm at the Golf Clan. Would love to connect with you. Um, I don't leave any messages unresponded to. Um, I'm in this to, to meet people, and you know honestly, to travel and to kind of experience different golf courses in different areas. And so I'm trying to make the world smaller. And, you know, if anyone is interested in teeing it up and is coming through Atlanta, I certainly, certainly reach out and say, you have an invitation to come tee it up with me. I mean, people, unless Bobby Jones resurrects himself from the dead, I'm not sure there's a cooler person in the metro Atlanta area to play with than Dougie. So (laughs) hit him up Uh, and jump into the DMs. And if you're going to be in Atlanta, talk to him. I mean, honestly, like that's what this world is about. It's about making connections, about meeting people with similar interests or, or maybe meeting people with you, you know, a like interest, but then finding something else out about them and, and then having yourself grow from that as well. So if you're there, hit them up, find them on the golf clan on YouTube at the golf clan on Instagram. Dougie, it's been an absolute pleasure, my man. Dan, thank you so much for having me on. This is awesome. And I'm also excited to see where leave the pin in goes next. Fantastic. All right, people, as always, either get busy golfing or get busy dying.